Six young girls were kidnapped by this man, tortured, chained, and molested, kept in a dungeon and fed them nothing. Some starved to death while some were buried alive. The catastrophic police investigation made him continue his crime in the most barbaric way possible. The crime was so horrific that the whole country of Belgium was in a rage. The crime of Marc Dutroux. Dutroux was taken for the first trial in March 2004 at the Belgium court. During the trial, the 44-year-old Marc Dutroux was shielded by bulletproof compartments considering his violence. And there, he revealed the dreadful sufferings that the six children had to go through under his captivity. Find out more about this evil man's case in today's video. Born on November 6, 1956 in Excel, Belgium, Marc Paul Alain Dutroux is a Belgian serial killer and child molester. He was the eldest child of his five other siblings. His parents, Victor and Janine, were both teachers. As a child, he had to go through repeated abuse. His parents used to beat him up regularly. After his parents got divorced in 1971, Dutroux left home and became a drifter and a callboy. At the age of 20, he got married and had two children. His childhood abuse impacted severely on his married life, and he admitted to beating his wife and cheating on her. Later in the 1980s, they separated, and he went on to marry Michelle Martin and have three more children with her. On June 9, 1996, Leticia Delez, a 14-year-old, disappeared after leaving the swimming pool in Betri, Luxembourg. There was a witness who saw a shabby white van with terrible engine noise and a partial registration number. The police, after some investigations, found out that the van belonged to Dutroux, who previously had allegations of physical abuse. With this evidence going into the public, police had no choice but to investigate further. They raided the house of Dutroux and arrested three people, Dutroux, his then-wife Michelle Martin, and Michelle Lelievre, a thief and drug addict who was completely dependent on Dutroux, were all arrested. The next statement Dutroux said after the arrest was, I'm going to give you two girls. With that atrocious statement, Dutroux shocked the police and helped them save two girls and solve the mystery of the other missing girls. On May 28, 1996, Sabine Dardan, a 12-year-old girl, went missing on her way to school. Though a case was filed against it, the investigation into Sabine froze gradually, just like other missing cases. And when Dutroux came forward with his offer of two girls instead of one, the other turned out to be Sabine, who went missing two months before Letitia was kidnapped. On June 14, 1996, Dutroux and Lelievre were arrested, and after two days of their arrest, they confessed to the crimes, and what they revealed about the other missing girls was terrifying. On June 24, 1995, almost a year before the arrest of Dutroux, Julie Lejeune and Melissa Russo, two eight-year-old classmates, were kidnapped after going on a walk in Grasse Halongne. He kept them in his house in Marcinelle, where he created a dungeon and kept the girls there. He also physically abused the girls several times and even filmed pornographic videos of the molestation. Two months after this, on August 23, Anne Marshall and Effie Lambrex, two teenage girls, were kidnapped by Dutroux and La Lièvre. The girls were going back to their holiday home. Since Julie and Melissa were being held captive in the dungeon, the two other girls, Marshall and Lambrex, were kept in a bedroom, all chained up. In September, both these girls were drugged and buried alive in Jumet by Dutroux and his partner, Bernard Weinstein. After the deaths of the girls, Weinstein and one of his friends, Philippe Divers, stole a van and hid it in a hangar. Later in November, the van was found by the hangar owner and was taken away by the police. Dutroux and Weinstein thought that they were betrayed by Philippe and his friend Rochelle. They were then lured away by Dutroux and Weinstein to his Jumet house and drugged and sequestered before going to Rochelle's house for some hints. Meanwhile, in Rochelle's house, Dutroux and Weinstein found his girlfriend Jadot and she was also taken to the house for questioning. While Dutroux and Weinstein were out picking someone else, Jadot managed to flee and alert a neighbor, who then called the cops. Dutroux tries to kill Weinstein as he is wanted by the police to prevent his capture. He then kidnapped Weinstein and held him captive in his Marcinelle house dungeon. During this time, the other girls who were held captive, Melissa and Julie, were allowed to roam the house. He fed Weinstein drug-induced food, 
and also placed hose clamps on Weinstein's testicles to make him speak about where he was hiding the money. He was then buried alive on his Sar la Bouchière property. In December 1995, Dutro was arrested for vehicle theft and imprisoned in jail for three to four months. When he was in jail, the girls Melissa and Julie were still alive in the house. Dutro's wife, Michelle, was supposed to restock the food and water for the girls after each time they ran out of food, but Michelle did not leave any food or water for the girls. Instead, visiting the house to feed the dog, when she was questioned, she said that she was too afraid to go to the dungeon, hence she neglected to feed the girls. According to Dutro's statement, the girls were still alive when he returned from prison on March 20, 1996. Julie died that day and Melissa died after four days, despite his efforts to save her. The bodies of these girls were buried in the garden of his house in sar le bouchier next to where Weinstein was buried. But the question remains unsolved. If Michelle didn't offer the girls food and water for three months, then how is it possible that the girls were still alive when Dutroux returned from prison? Well, if the higher authorities had conducted proper investigation and questioning, then all the mysteries would have been solved now. It was two months after this that he kidnapped the other two girls, Letitia and Sabine, on June 14, 1996. Two days after confessing the crime, Dutro led the policemen to sar le bouchier where they discovered the bodies of Weinstein, Melissa, and Julie. Later on September 3rd, they also located the remains of Marshall and Lambrex, the two girls who were buried alive in Jumet. The police recovered hundreds of videos and homemade adult films that were taken while molesting the kidnapped girls. One of the survivors, Sabine, wrote a book about her life and the kidnapping, I Choose to Live. In it, she describes how she fought back, interrogated, and demanded Dutro. He convinced her by saying that he was her only ally, and her parents had failed to save her from the vicious men who were trying to kill her. Though 12 years old during the time of the kidnapping, Sabine fought as much as she could. She spent 80 days in the dungeon. During her imprisonment, Sabine was allowed to write emotional letters to her family and friends, which were never sent to the respective people. When she said she wanted to meet one of her friends, Dutro kidnapped Letitia. Thankfully, someone spotted the kidnapping scene and noted the registration number, or else these kids would have faced the same fate as the previous victims. When Dutro was sentenced to prison for life, she decided to write the book. The main reason for her to write the book was so that people would stop giving her strange looks and questions, and so that the judicial system would never again free a pedophile from such behavior. For eight years, the media focused on the torturer and not the victims. She says getting into the hands of a pedophile is torturous, and even when they manage to survive and get on with their lives, others must support them rather than make them feel insecure. The sad truth is this could have been stopped when it was started with Melissa and Julie if the police investigated the case more responsibly. When the girls were kidnapped, Dutro was the prime suspect, considering his history of committing similar crimes. The police even searched Dutro's house twice and failed to rescue Melissa and Julie, who were kept in the dungeon of that house. Though they heard some girls crying, they ignored it. They even got a speculum from the floor which they handed over to Michelle rather than taking it for forensic investigation. They also got a call from Dutro's parents stating that their son had kidnapped two girls and was being kept in his house. The police also failed to follow up on this as well. During the house search, police recovered several hair samples, which were not sent to forensics. When questioned about the same, they said that there was no use for forensic investigation in this case, as no one was allowed to enter the house except the arrested three. It was also revealed that the whole 5,000 hair samples were analyzed, and they got nothing. No evidence or report of the test was submitted, just a random statement. Even from the recovered bodies of the dead girls, no DNA samples were taken, as the bodies were said to be decomposed to such a level that the samples could not be taken, though the bodies were not in such a condition and were still fit to be analyzed. When Melissa's body was recovered, her parents were not allowed to identify their daughter, Instead, they confirmed it was Melissa's after confirmation from Dutro. Her autopsy revealed that she was molested repeatedly for quite a long time. However, no evidence was taken from her body to prove Dutro was the molester. On October 14, 1996, 
Even the judge, Jean-Marc Connerot, was replaced considering his impartiality after he attended a fundraising dinner for the victim's families. It was because of him that the case saw some advancement and progress. The judge was on the verge of revealing high-profile people who were involved in this and said that businessman Michel Nihol was the brain behind these kidnappings. When the bodies of Melissa and Julie were discovered, Michel Lelievre informed the police that this business was happening between VIPs who kidnap innocent girls, torture them, molest them, and even kill them for pleasure. Michel Nihol's name came up repeatedly when talking about this business. Nihol was a Brussels businessman, a pub owner, and a familiar face at adult parties. Dutro and Nihol used to meet at the exercise yard and make plans. When Lelievre was arrested and questioned, he revealed a lot about Nihol. He met Nihol at a restaurant in Brussels. Nihol introduced himself as the monster of Belgium. A person who is so confident in committing any crime believes that he will not be caught or sentenced. He even told Lelievre that he would never attend the trials, as all the evidence that was against him would never be heard by the jury. The sadistic man was confident, as he had information about most of the famous people in the country, including various judges, attorneys, politicians, and more. Most of them were directly or indirectly involved in this adult business. Nihol always denied the fact that he was a pedophile, but he also enjoyed his notoriety, and he considers all the fame he earned due to his crime as a credit. The network behind this massive crime was beginning to come to the spotlight with Lelievre's statement. However, he suddenly stopped cooperating as he had been threatened. Both Nihol and Dutro were confident that they would never come to trial and that they would never come to court as he had information about people that would bring the government down. Later, when it was announced to the public that anyone having any relationship with pedophiles was asked to come forth and give information if they had any, a woman named Regina Loof came forward with her testimony. She said that he had been working at adult parties from a very young age. She had been given away by her parents to a family friend, Tony Van den Boguer. This man had a key to their house and he would collect Regina from her school and take her to weekend adult parties. At this party, she got to witness the darker side of the world. She was given to other men, and they filmed themselves making out with her. The parties would be highly organized and attended by big business people, judges, politicians, and bankers with a lot of money involved in them. In 1996, she encountered a police team. They carefully filmed the activity under supervised conditions among whom some were judges, the country's most powerful politicians, and a prominent banker. She said that the parties were not just for lovemaking, but they were way more than that. All the clients did not reveal their names, but Regina stated their names as she knew them and the policemen to different locations, houses, apartments, and districts where she was taken with other girls to specific clients. They shoot molestation of young girls, and even worse, torture and murder the girls for pleasure. The main man behind these parties was Nihol, whom she knew by the name Mish. She described him as a very cruel and dangerous man. He abused children in the most bizarre ways. Dutro also accompanied Nihol. Dutro was a boy who brought drugs and girls and watched whatever happened at the parties. On the other hand, Nihol became a part of molestation and murder. According to Regina, they once killed a girl named Chrissy by torturing her brutally. Her legs, hands, and throat were connected with the same rope, and when the girl tried to move, she would strangle herself. Nihol was part of this murder, and Detroit was just a spectator. The girl's body was found in 1984, dumped on the grounds of a mushroom farm on the outskirts of Brussels. The farm was later demolished. Regina's testimony stated the wallpaper print, intricate designs, the sinks, a network of stairs, hooks on the ceiling, and adjoining rooms unique to that building. The majority of these features were found in the demolished parts, and only someone who had visited that place and witnessed the whole scenario could explain such details. Regina Loof's testimony played a major role in ripping the masks of various people off and bringing the cruelty in front of the people. If all her statements turned out to be true, then Nihol and Dutro could have been the prime suspects for the child abductions. However, while police were investigating her story, Connerot was fired from the case, and the crucial lead they had obtained was lost. Connerot was replaced by Judge Jacques Langlois, for whom this was his very first case. This didn't end there. 
The next group of people who were sacked was the police team who had interviewed Regina Loof and other witnesses. They had almost verified Regina's story, and at least one of the murders she described matched the unsolved puzzle. When the mushroom farm incident was taken to court, Regina was accused of making up the stories and was declared a fantasist. For almost 12 years, Chrissy's murder was unsolved. The judge who was in charge of handling the case was Van Espen. When Regina accused Nihol and Dutroux of the girl's murder, he saw no interest in conflict nor reason to resign. He was not even sacked like Connerot, but he ordered the police officers not to take any part in the case. Something was suspicious about the judge. It was then that a Belgian journalist revealed the close relationship between Nihol and Van Espen. He had represented Nihol's wife as a lawyer, and his sister was Nihol's child's godmother. When his relationship with Nihol was exposed, Van Espen resigned as the judge in charge of the Mushroom Factory investigation. In 1997, a new team was assigned to recheck Regina's testimony. The press and the public raged knowing all this. They were brought back under control by telling them that the previous team manipulated Regina's testimony. Then began the media campaign, whose main focus was to defame Regina Loof and her testimony. Regina, who was known by the codename X1, was revealed to the public and media. They even started a campaign through the government-owned TV station, RTBF, focusing on proving that Dutroux kidnapped all the girls for himself and that he was an isolated pervert, so there was no network. Through this, they also wanted to show that Nihol was innocent and Regina was a liar. Some TV shows portrayed Regina as a psychopath, and even her parents were shown as victims who were accused of false allegations by Regina. Though her parents admitted that their child was given to Tony Van de Boguer, the family friend who had the house key and unlimited access to Regina, the media hid this from the viewers. They even hid the truth that Van Den himself admitted his relationship with Regina Loop. The media spent hours and hours of airtime focusing on Regina to destroy her name. Van Den lives in the borderlands, untouched by the law or the media, while Regina, who revealed the truth about her abuse as a child and that of several other children, was defamed. The media succeeded in this, and the judge announced that Loof would never be considered a victim or witness in any trials related to Dutroux or Nihol. Regina's statement, along with the other witnesses, was declared useless and irrelevant. The Dutroux's investigation was deeply followed by the Russos, Melissa's parents. They strongly neglected to believe what the press said and believed that Dutroux had connections with other people for this business. Dutroux admits that he held the girls captive, but he denies kidnapping, molesting, or murdering the girls. He even said that he tried his best to save the girl. After all the grief and loss they had suffered, the Russos never believed a word the police said. They suspect the girls were not there at all when Dutroux was arrested for car theft. If they did, they would have been dead way before and not even be alive for four months without food and water. Several reports stated that Melissa was spotted in an upstairs room at Charleroi nightclub. The police failed to follow up with these reports, and hence the Russos were convinced that someone else had access to the girls, and the girls were transported to several places. All the hair samples from the dungeon were analyzed, and they came up with the result that nothing of any evidence made the parents even more suspicious. How can 5,000 samples of hair be of no use? However, according to investigation sources, the hairs were never tested. Dutroux alone was charged with the kidnapping, murder, and abuse of the victims, even though no DNA samples or autopsies were done. Though many other witnesses came forward with clues, they were all slowly found dead which obviously was a murder-turned-suicide case. One of those was Bruno Tagliaferro, who knew about the kidnapping of Julie and Melissa. In 1995, Bruno told his wife that Dutroux was trying to kill him. When Bruno was found dead of a heart attack, his wife Fabienne Japar refused to accept that it was a natural death, and she knew something was not right. Bruno's samples were sent to the U.S. for analysis, and it was found that he had been poisoned. Fabian told the media that she is determined to find the killer of her husband, but soon she was found dead in her bed, which was also declared a suicide. Since 1995, there have been over 20 witnesses with unexplained deaths connected with Dutroux. Though two girls were rescued and four other bodies were recovered, there are still a lot of unsolved kidnapping cases of young girls in Belgium that remain a mystery. 
People still believe that Dutro is responsible for at least some of the kidnapping cases of young girls that have not been solved yet. In the end, after the trial, Michelle was sentenced to 30 years in prison, Michelle Lelievre to 25 years in prison, and Dutro to life imprisonment. The Dutro case is believed to be one of the most sadistic crimes that increased due to the neglectful behavior of the police and higher authorities. People also suspect that high-profile people like politicians, judges, and others were involved in the case of Dutro. Because Dutro was able to commit these crimes in the daylight and slip away from being caught, it's a riddle to be solved. Along with that, all the witnesses found dead, the forensic analysis of the murdered girls not done properly, are all indications that this was led by a group of high-profile people or mafias who were capable of doing anything. Though there's no evidence supporting the crimes against these people, they still wander around us, continuing their sins.